Okay, welcome everybody. Um, um, it's a great pleasure to announce uh, the speaker of this uh, session of the ICM 2022, uh, Roland Bauerschmidt uh, from uh, Cambridge. Um, Roland Bauerschmidt uh, did his uh, undergraduate studies uh, at the ETH uh, of uh, ETH of Zurich. Um, it, uh, then his uh, PhD at the University of British Columbia in 2013 had positions as a postdoc in uh, Harvard and the Institute for Advanced Study and is now professor uh, of probability uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, in 2015 at the ICMT, uh, he was awarded uh, the Young Scientist Award for his work on self-avoiding random walks in four dimensions uh, and the development uh, of SUSY renormalization group techniques uh, for their study. And since 2019, uh, he uh, is uh, beneficial, uh, ben uh, he benefits from a ERC starting grant. And uh, yeah, so the talk um, will be on spin systems with hyperbolic symmetry. Uh, it will be um, a recorded talk, so there's not going to be the um, um, a possibility to ask questions uh, directly, but uh, there is the possibility ability to do it via the Discord server. So we can now start. Roland Bauerschmidt from Cambridge, and he will speak about spin systems with hyperbolic symmetry. Hello? Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be in Helsinki. In this talk on hyperbolic spin models, I'll um, try to focus on general aspects, not so much on technical ones. right here. Uh, anyway, um, so let's hope this uh, doesn't happen too often. Um, uh, I will begin uh, with a little bit of motivation and background where these problems are coming from, at least from my perspective. Uh, this is not the only perspective. Um, the models I'll be talking about have various motivation, but from my perspective, um, the problems of uh, the Anderson transition and uh, the magnetism transition and the classical Heisenberg models are the problems that inspired us to look at these problems. Um, let me be clear, we have nothing new to say about these two problems here. Um, uh, the first of these is a, a famous uh, problem in mathematical physics. It's about the metal insulator transition. Um, I'll always be working on uh, ZD, or let's say a finite portion of ZD when convenient. And uh, I'm only interested in dimensions at least two. Dimension one is sort of a different game and a different setting. I'm not going to be talking about dimension one. Um, uh, two uh, popular models for the metal insulator transition are the random Schrodinger operator or Anderson operator, um, uh, written here, a lattice Laplacian plus an IID potential, uh, let's say Gaussian IID. Uh, with some coupling constant lambda in front of it. Uh, another popular model in many uh, senses, uh, perhaps simpler, is, is that of random band matrices. So bands, meaning d-dimensional bands here. Uh, so this is a matrix with, uh, let's say, Gaussian entries, um, independent, uh, and essentially zero variance outside of band. And again, there's a parameter in this model, which is the bandwidth. Um, and I'm um, writing the bandwidth as 1 over lambda because, roughly speaking, you should think of lambda and 1 over the bandwidth as equivalent. And again, I'm, I'm interested in the setting of statistical uh, mechanics. Um, these parameters, lambda, bandwidth, or the strength of the, in, of the, of the coupling in the Anderson model, I, I want them to be independent of the size of the matrix. Um, so, um, the basic question from a statistical physics point of view, uh, these models, that, or that, that's somehow where the motivation for these models came from, um, is, is that of the metal insulator transition. Um, you can ask, um, for a given uh, dimension and coupling strength, uh, what is the nature of the eigenfunctions? And uh, the sort of general picture is that uh, if they're extended, that should correspond to a metallic phase, there is a conductance. Um, if the eigenfunctions are localized, it should correspond to an insulating phase. Um, and this will depend on where in the spectrum you are, what 
um, what the parameters are, but I'm not going to go into details of this because I'm not going to uh, um, say anything new about this problem. Uh, so it's a, it's a big problem to uh, establish that whether there is a transition or not, in any dimension at least two. Um, um, and well, one way to... Um, well, one way to consider this is uh, by looking at what I'll be calling the two-point function. Um, so this two-point function is um, uh, the expectation of the absolute value squared of the resolvent. Um, um, so as two points, x and y, which are points in ZD or the lattice, uh, lambda, and um, well, that's why it's called the two-point function. Uh, but the point I want to emphasize is that there's an absolute value inside the expectation, and that that's absolutely essential. If you don't put an absolute value here, you're not going to learn anything about the localization or delocalization of the eigenfunctions. And it's also what makes this problem um, uh, difficult. Um, one approach to this problem um, that's been proposed uh, going back to uh, Franz Wegner in the late 70s and uh, significantly developed by others, uh, Efetov, Zirnbauer, Merlin, Fyodorov are some names uh, to mention, is the relation, uh, exact relation, of, of, um, of uh, quantities such as this two-point function to a, a, a spin system. So a spin system is a sort of more classical uh, statistical mechanical system, but one with sort of non-classical features, which are the ones uh, I'll be discussing, hyperbolic symmetry and supersymmetry. And um, this, unfortunately, this, is, this relation is exact and simple. You can write it down a couple lines. Unfortunately, it's not a panacea. It, um, it's uh, extremely difficult looking to, uh, and um, it's not clear whether mathematically um, this approach is going to be the one that will solve this problem eventually or not. Uh, nonetheless, um, it's interesting and has interesting features, and uh, much of the physics understanding is based on this picture. Um, uh, why is that? Well, it's, it's a system that kind of looks like problems that uh, physicists have a lot of experience with, because it, these kinds of uh, systems appear in quantum field theory and um, uh, all sorts of problems in statistical physics. So there's a lot of um, um, understanding of how, how such systems should behave, and um, which, which can be used uh, in this context. Now, the, what I'll be talking about are models that are motivated by this. They won't describe uh, these, these models. They have some of the features that um, uh, these models have. Um, and it turns out they will also describe different um, and of uh, different statistical physics systems of independent interest. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, but the approach is kind of uh, similar to, to what, we'd what one would like to do here in, in this approach. But, okay, before getting into this, let me um, say what I mean by a spin system. And so by spin system, the, what you should have in mind is the classical Heisenberg model. So what's the classical Heisenberg model? Uh, again, we have a graph, uh, lambda, uh, set of um, so lattice here, let's say finite one. Um, at every lattice site, there's a spin, which takes values in the sphere, uh, two-dimensional uh, sphere. Um, and so I'm going to be noting these spins by ux. x is the point in the lattice, ux is the point in the sphere. Um, and the expectation of the classical Heisenberg model, the or ferromagnet, is, uh, is given as this. Um, you integrate over uh, all spin configurations with this uh, Gibbs weight. Uh, what does this Gibbs weight do? Well, it tries to align spins. Um, and um, the larger beta is, the more it tries to align the spins. Um, so maybe slightly more familiar is the Ising model, which is defined exactly the same way, except that the spins are plus minus one rather than on the sphere. And the basic question in this case is, well, do spins align over long distances or not? And again, this will depend on the coupling constant beta and the dimension d. And again, uh, the essential information is encoded in two-point functions. For example, in the most natural one is this uh, symmetric two-point function, just the inner product of the spins at two sites, x and y. 
in the expectation. Uh, but to make the ana analogy with the previous slide a uh, bit more close, a bit closer, you can also introduce a magnet magnetic field. This is often a, a useful thing to do. Uh, so you introduce another parameter h um, that prefers some direction, uh, let's say third coordinate direction, and then you. Uh, uh, then it would be natural to look at the correlations orthogonal to the direction in which the external field uh, points. So external field points, say, the third direction, so then you can look at these uh, transversal correlations. And uh, you have another two-point function, which now has two parameters. And again, the uh, interesting information is, is contained when h goes to zero. So this, this parameter h here is... Uh, um, uh, in correspondence to this parameter eta here, which I didn't discuss in the resolvent, it's, it's convenient to uh, shift a little bit away from the spectrum. Um, and um, uh, the, you, this parameter has exactly, the, um, in this representation, um, uh, the role of the magnetic field. Okay, so this is the um, classical Heisenberg model. Um, basic question is, is there a phase transition or not? Um, um, this case, this case is much better understood. Um, 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 I, I get, I get there in a bit. Um, much better understood, but I would say not, in, still not understood in the way we would like. Um, uh, there's many things we don't understand, and some of the things we do understand are, are still very hard to access. Um, uh, th so this is an example of uh, what's also known as a nonlinear sigma model. Um, so these are models that are defined this way, um, uh, where spins take values in, in some manifold, uh, usually a symmetric space, and uh, so which is called the target space. In this case, the target is just a sphere. Sorry, D is the dimension. Um, okay, so um, uh, what plays a big role in the behavior of these systems is the symmetry. Uh, this this case, uh, the symmetry is O3, and it's what is important about O3 is that it's not a billion. If you take a model with only two components where symmetry is a billion, it's a different game than this one. Uh, okay, so so much for motivation. Uh, so these are um, the the models I'll actually be uh, presenting are the next two. Um, but the point of view will be uh, will be motivated by this. So the first model is. Um, a model of linearly reinforced walks. So we, we're looking at um, walks, so xt, t is a continuous uh, parameter, and the, the walk takes uh, values in the lattice, um, uh, given by the, f it's a stochastic process, uh, and uh, it's not a, but it's not a Markovian process. So the uh, transition rates depend on the entire history of the walk. Um, you go from one, uh, site um, uh, x at time t to site y, uh, you jump to some other site y with the following rates. Well, let me explain this a little bit. Um, uh, you jump to neighbors. If you drop this blue term here, what you have is just a, a simple, uh, simple random walk. Uh, just uh, you go independently to nearest neighbors. Um, and the parameter beta, which appears in front, uh, has no significance then, because it's just rescaling time, and you can just rescale time by beta and get rid of it. But if you put this blue term, uh, then the beta in front does matter. Um, uh, so what does the blue term do? Well, the blue term uh, gives a preference to sites that were vis visited before. So the walk wants to go back to uh, sites that were visited previously. Uh, so that, that's, how the walk, that's why the walk is not Markovian, it's history dependent. Um, and the strength of this reinforcement is uh, related to this parameter beta. Um, it turns out, maybe when you see this uh, first time, somewhat counterintuitively, the larger beta is, the, less, the weaker is the reinforcement. So a beta small corresponds to strong reinforcement, beta large to weak reinforcement. And, uh, well, in this case, the natural question is, how does the walk behave, depending on the parameters beta and d, again, uh, in particular, you may wonder if the reinforcement is weak, does it look like a simple random walk, say? Is, does it, is it diffuse? If the, primary, if the reinforcement is strong, the walk wants to go back to sites visited before a lot, uh, does the walk localize? And again, you can access this in different ways, but a convenient way is to look at a two-point function. 
Um, it's, in this case, it's the two-point function is this. Uh, it's defined like the two-point function of a simple random walk, except that the walk is this one. It's this uh, reinforced walk. Um, in this case, again, the parameters. One parameter is the uh, reinforcement strength or the inverse reinforcement strength. Um, and the other parameter is a killing rate you can add. Um, and again, this killing rate is going to have an interpretation sort of analogous to a magnetic field. Um, it turns out, uh, and I'll get there, that this two-point function is in fact exactly equal to the two-point function of a nonlinear sigma model, so something like the Heisenberg model we saw on the previous slide, except that the target space is not a sphere, but uh, it's what's called uh, the hyperbolic superplane, which I will explain. Um, and this relation is exact. In fact, this model, H22, the hyperbolic superplane, uh, was introduced not because um, the person who introduced this uh, uh, model, which is uh, Martin Zirnbauer, was interested in this model, but he was interested in the Anderson transition. And he introduced this model as a simplification of, of the models that arise when you're trying to understand the Anderson transition. He basically removed the variables that based on his physical understanding, uh, he was sure are irrelevant for the transition. He removed those, got a simpler model, a simpler symmetric space, um, um, or supersymmetric space, which this is, and um, um, that, that's how this uh, model was uh, conceived. Uh, it, the connection with these walks came later, and I will explain that as well. Um, so this is the first model. Um, the second model, is one of random forests. So again, we start with our graph G of, so say, a finite portion of the lattice. Um, and then we're looking at uh, subgraphs, uh, which are forests. So a subgraph is a forest um, if it doesn't have any cycles. So I, I cannot, so what you see on the slide is an example of a forest. Let me perhaps mention that the vertex set is the same vertex set as the original vertex set. So there could be components uh, that just consist of a single vertex. Um, and of course, it's called a forest because every component is a tree. Um, so it's, it's not that original in that sense. And um, the model on random forests, um, it goes under a different name, but I like the name a boreal gas, um, goes under, is, is defined as follows. So, it's a probability measure on such forests. Uh, again, it depends on a parameter beta. And uh, the probability law is as follows. Uh, well, first, f has to be a forest, uh, signaled by that indicator function. And then every forest receives a weight, which is beta to the number of edges in the forest. So that, that's the arboreal gases. Again, a very simple model. Um, note that this parameter beta somehow controls the density of the forest. The larger beta is, the more edges um, there should be. In particular, as beta goes to infinity, what you get is a uniform spanning tree, sort of a fully packed configuration. If beta is zero, uh, every component would just consist of a single vertex. Um, uh, okay, so this is uh, this model of random forest called the arboreal gas. It also has various other motivations and interpretations. Um, maybe uh, from a physical perspective, uh, one can mention that this model was um, proposed by Lubensky and Isaac, Isaacson as a model for the gel transition in polymers, so it has some physical um, significance, but I'll be honest, it's not why we got excited about the model. Um, uh, there's various other interpretations. For example, from a combinatorial perspective, it's very natural. It's a uniform measure on spanning force, so at least if uh, beta is 1, and if beta is not 1, it's a uniform measure on the weighted graph. So it's a very natural combinatorial model, and for that reason also uh, proposed by uh, uh, various people in combinatorics. Um, it's, uh, you can view it as a very singular conditioning of Bernoulli bond percolation, it's Bernoulli bond percolation condition not to have any cycles. That's the same. Um, it arises in the study of the POTS model um, in the following way. The POTS model, there is a very um, well-known and um, 
relation to what's called the random cluster model. It's a representation of, uh, linked to the POTS model, and uh, the arboreal gas arises in the limit of Q, as Q goes to zero of, um, of the random cluster representation of the POTS model. And last but not least, this is a model, it's a hardcore model of lattice trees. Um, so there's hard, um, hard interaction between the trees, um, and this in general difficult, and so in this case, it's interesting to see what happens, especially in the high density regime. And so, what, what's the basic question in this case? Well, the basic question is: Well, what what does the configure what do the configurations look like? Are the trees big or small? So, in particular, you can ask whether there is a tree that is macroscopic uh, that spans, say, a positive fraction of the graph, or if all trees are small. And again, this will depend on uh, the dimension and on the parameter beta. And again, there is a convenient way uh, to access this information through a two-point function, uh, which in this case, the most natural one is just the uh, connection probability. So uh, two-point function is just the probability that two points x and y are the same component. Um, okay, so, and as it turns out, this model, which uh, has lots of independent motivation, also turns out to be exactly related to a nonlinear sigma model with a different target space. Uh, in this case, the target space is uh, uh, what I call H02, uh, and uh, it's the fermionic uh, hyperbolic uh, plane, and I'll ex also explain why that is. Um, okay, so, so the last two models, reinforced walks and these random forests, are the ones I'll, I'll actually uh, be talking about. But, so, um, but as I hinted at, the connection to these sigma models is sort of uh, why, I'd, why I presented the, the first two models, because that's where a lot of the motivation and, uh, comes, came from, to understand aspects of these models. Um, um, for example, the ones uh, relevant for the Anderson transition uh, that are beyond what um, sort of the classical uh, spin models and statistical mechanics uh, describe. Okay, so, so let me finally tell you what these models are. So this model uh, uh, H22 and this model H02. What are, what are these, these nonlinear sigma models with these target spaces? Um, before doing that, I'll... Uh, I'll tell you about another model where um, uh, the target space is just the, hyper, just the ordinary hyperbolic plane. So it's like, like the Heisenberg model, except that spins are not in the sphere, but in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, I could leave it at that, but let me describe this a bit more concretely. Um, so I'll use a particular uh, convenient realization of the hyperbolic plane, uh, which is the hyperboloid model. So uh, vectors uh, have three components. I'll denote them by Z, V, and W. And uh, the index X is the vertex. I'll ultimately have one vector for each uh, site. So they're in uh, three dimensions, or I should rather say in one plus two dimensions, because uh, three dimensions should be regarded as Minkowski space, because the inner product we'll be using is the Minkowski inner product. And then the hyperbolic plane can be realized as, um, uh, as this, um, as well, this kind of sphere, the inner product of uh, the spins with them, well, the points with themselves should be equal to minus one. Um, that would, in fact, give two branches or two hyperbolates, one at the bottom as well, and we only want one of them, so that's what the constraint Z positive does. And so this gives a version to realize the hyperbolic plane. More concretely, this is a two-dimensional manifold. Um, we can parameterize it by two coordinates, and again, there's various ways to do this. In fact, there's better ways than the following one, but um, um, just to be concrete, you could use the two uh, V and W coordinates as, uh, or components as coordinates, and then solve the constraint for, for Z. And, um, and then you can write, um, uh, so that gives, the, gives coordinates, and then you can also write the uh, Lorentz invariant integral on hyperbolic space uh, in the following explicit way. As, in, as a Lebesgue integral over V and W, and then there's the volume form uh, relevant for, um, um, for the Lorentz symmetry. Um, okay. And the hyperbolic sigma model um, is with target space H2 is defined just in the same way as the Heisenberg model. I, in fact, just uh, copied the equation. Um, uh, same definition, with the only change that the integral is not over S2, but over H2. That's the only change. Um, 
Uh, this model was studied by Spencer Zernbauer. It turns out, from a statistical physics point of view, this model is not super exciting. It doesn't have a phase transition. Um, um, it, it's not super interesting from that perspective. Uh, um, what is more interesting is, um, are the supersymmetric versions of these models. And uh, that is also, so, so that goes as follows. Um, um, the fermionic hyperbolic plane, so this is what's relevant for random forests, is defined in exactly the same way as on the previous uh, slide, except that the two uh, components, uh, which were previously in purple and called the V and W, are replaced by uh, Grassmann variables, so anti-commuting variables. So these are formal variables, uh, Xi, X, and eta X, which all anti-commute, Grassmann variables. Um, so this is formal. There's a formal analog of the inner product. You just replace the Euclidean inner product on the, on the two components, V and W, by the um, correct analog for these anti-commuting variables, which is uh, also known as the symplectic inner product here. And then you can uh, define an analog of this hyperbolic plane. And that's what the hyper fermionic hyperbolic plane is. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the simplest instance of... Um, of, of a symmetric uh, superspace in the sense of uh, Berezin. Um, it's, in fact, much simpler than, or geometrically, it's in many ways simpler than the hyperbolic plane itself. It's a little bit unusual, uh, well, less well-known, but it's, it's, it's a very nice object. Um, you can, again, realize it very concretely. The z-coordinate can be solved in terms of the other two coordinates, um, like this. Uh, the square root with these anti-commuting variables is just defined by a formal expansion. So it's just like this. And there is um, a, a super integral, um, uh, which is defined like this. So this is a Grassmann integral. Uh, it doesn't matter so much if you have not seen this before. I, I don't, I'm not going to go into the pre precise definition. But what's important is that it respects the symmetry uh, given by this formula in our product, which is a supergroup symmetry uh, uh, of OSP12. Um, so, um, you should think about this as that basically everything you would want to do in the ordinary, um, say, Heisenberg model also works here. You can look at correlation functions, evaluate them. Um, and um, so that's how the fermionic hyperbolic sigma model is defined, same way as before, except that the integral is now the super integral over the fermionic hyperbolic plane. All of the other definitions remain the same. Um, and then you can um, combine the two. You can add the commuting variables back, and that's what gives what's known as the hyperbolic superplane. So you have the anti-commuting and the commuting variable. You basically put both of them in, um, and everything works pretty much the same. Um, and um, um, then you, um, all definitions are formally the same, except you you change the corresponding formal inner product. Uh, but again, you can evaluate correlations and all things like that. There's a, there's a well-defined um, calculus for, for these uh, superspaces due to Berezin. And it works, in, in many, um, it works very much the same as, as ordinary calculus. Sometimes there's a few minuses and so on that one has to keep track of, but it works very much the same. And so this is this H22 model, which is the one related to uh, reinforced walks. So, so here are the relations, uh, or there are more relations, but so, so here's a presentation of the relations in sort of what I think the most striking form. Uh, you can look, uh, so I've defined for you what this hyperbolic sigma model target space H22 and H02 is. We look at H22, I mentioned there's a connection to the vertex reinforced jump process, and the connection is like this, or one of the connections is like this. The two-point function of the walk equals exactly the transversal two-point function of, of the sigma model. Um, that's it. There's, there's more. You can say, that, in fact, the relation uh, goes further. You can say much more, but let me leave it at this. The two-point function are equal. Um, similar relations exist between uh, the fermionic hyperbolic sigma model and the uh, aboreal gas, so that's the force model. In this case, the symmetric two-point function equals the percolation probability. Uh, the transversal two-point function equals what's um, um, known as the 
truncated connection probability. So these are exact relations. Um, uh, they are, once you know they exist, they're not terribly hard to prove. They're um, a bit tricky to guess. Uh, so, for example, you could vary these dimensions here more, and uh, uh, we don't know what, the, what and if the interesting statistical physics models are. But once you know the relation exists, they're actually not so hard to prove. Um, it gives a very different perspective on these statistical physics problems. Um, it basically describes these statistical physics problems as uh, sort of using the intuition that one would have when studying uh, a Heisenberg model. <clears throat> and what plays, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, or I put some emphasis on the symmetries. Um, um, so in the Heisenberg model, the symmetry was O3, and in, in this H02 model, the symmetry is OSP12, uh, and, and so on. Um, and uh, symmetries, uh, whenever you have a symmetry in, uh, in a physical system, um, it has an implication. Um, uh, symmetries are very important. And so for these models, they, they imply identities, which are called Ward identities. So whenever you have a spin model as a symmetry, you can derive a Ward identity. Um, so and so these, these Ward identities that arise in these systems, they, they have very natural and simple interpretation at the probabilistic side. They, they correspond, for example, to uh, the fact that what appears on the right-hand side, that these are probabilistic objects. That they're less than one, that if you sum over one point, you get one, and so on. So, that's, so these kind of structural features of these functions are encoded by symmetries of, of these models, and that's, that's part of um, the power of this approach, because these symmetries are... Um, in, 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 well sort of the structural features uh, become symmetries, and symmetries is something that um, um, one can, for example, try to preserve in certain operations and so on, so there's something nice to work with. Um, this is, um, so the, the, there's, uh, let me just mention that this is completely analogous to um, relations that are well known in random matrix theory. For example, there are relations similar like, to this for um, um, Resolvents, um, uh, often also called the part X. Hello, um, uh, and and they correspond to similar uh, to to similar uh, features on on the random matrix side, the so-called quantum sum rule, or um, uh, again essentially equivalent to this conservation of probability. So they have the same structural features. Now. What I mentioned is that the description as these uh, sigma models, um, the good thing about it is that uh, we, or in physics, there's a lot of experience how to understand these models. So, for example, we basically, in all of the models I discussed, they looked very different, but in all of these models, we basically is, expect behavior that's more or less the same as in the Heisenberg model. What is that behavior? We expect if uh, temperature is high, um, that the situation is simple, correlations decay exponentially, eigenfunctions are localized, um, trees are small, um, um, the, uh, the VRJP localizes, um, uh, etc. Um, on the other hand, when the temperature is um, uh, low, um, we expect um, the, the symmetry of, of these spin models to break, so this is analogous to the Ising model at low temperature, there's a magnetization um, that appears. But because of the continuous nature of these models, the corrections to the magnetizations will be uh, diffusive, um, the so-called Goldstone mode. Um, and then in two dimensions, um, we more or less explore. We, um, uh, we expect that uh, symmetry doesn't break, um, so this is three dimensions, and two dimensions we expect that symmetry doesn't break, like here, uh, and, uh, well, we more or less expect that uh, correlations always decay exponentially. Um, and <clears throat> so this is a general picture. Um, I I'll give a few references in a second. Uh, but one f uh, point I want to emphasize is that 
maybe the high temperature regime is, it doesn't really matter what you do. Uh, the high temperature regime, you can usually do somehow. Um, uh, it's, it's not sensitive to the details of the model. Um, the low temperature regime, on the other hand, is. Uh, symmetry plays an extremely important role of what happens at low temperature. Whatever you have a statistical mechanics model at low temperature, the symmetry of the model is very important. And so the, these latter two points, the low temperature regime and also what happens in two dimension, is very much associated to what the symmetry of these models is. And um, um, okay, so um, let me give you just a brief sketch of um, a very brief. Uh, let me flash very, very briefly what we know. I already mentioned that at high temperature, in essentially all models, we know everything. And um, uh, maybe let me leave it at that. Um, uh, low temperature, the um, uh, situation is much more subtle. Um, so as I mentioned, we expect long-range order in all of these models, and the uh, correlations are diffusive. Um, we know this in the Heisenberg model. Um, uh, the long-range order is, if you allow nearest neighbor interaction, it's, uh, it's very clever, but not difficult. It's Frelick, Simon, Spencer. But to see the diffusive correction is very hard. Um, um, but um, it's understood, at least by some. Um, um, uh, in the other models, um, um, the, the, the two I proposed, uh, the VRJP and the boil gas, um, uh, we also know this kind of behavior. We know uh, symmetry breaks at low temperature. We know that the corrections are diffusive, or quasi-diffusive here. Um, um, but all of, okay. But the, the random matrix problem, of course, is, a famous, is the famous open problem of uh, quantum diffusion. Um, uh, but these, these are, so. Unlike the high temperature regime, uh, what uh, we do understand these models, but perhaps not as um, simple and robust way as we would like, so that we could sort of combine all of the different models to to get to the last one. All of these these arguments are sort of difficult and use uh, more features than we would like. Um, two dimensions. Um, well, two dimensions. I mentioned. Uh, we expect exponential decay at all temperatures, a famous open, uh, famous conjecture in all, all these uh, models, uh, related, also, or sometimes called dynamic mass generation, also related to the um, a similar problem in uh, uh, gauge theory. Um, um, it was wide open in all of these models. Um, what we always know basically is that um, there is no magnetization and that and their polynomial bounds on correlations. Uh, so these are kind of arguments of uh, Merman-Wagner type. Um, um, but it's, uh, this is wide open. OK. Um, so this is a brief uh, overview of sort of um, uh, the general picture and maybe increasing difficulty. Um, let me. Uh, illustrate in the case of the boreal gas a little bit more concretely what this means, because I think it's uh, it's um, um, at least to me it's a, it's a relatively convincing example of of, of this approach to these problems. Because um, um, okay, let me go through the cases. So the high temperature case in this case is easy. You can do it in different ways: uh, high temperature expansions, or you dominate by percolation, and you know you get the exponential decay. Um, the two-dimensional case I mentioned, where we know a polynomial bound um, in two dimensions, and it holds at all temperatures, all, all strengths. Um, so the percolation probability always decays at least polynomially. So this is very different from what happens if you go to ordinary percolation, where, of course, uh, it's very well known that there is a percolation transition in two dimensions. In fact, a very interesting one. These models do not have a percolation transition in two dimensions, and their boreal gas never percolates in two dimensions. Um, we, in fact, expect all trees are, ex uh, have, are exponentially small. That we don't know, but we know at least the connection probability keys decay polynomially. Um, this is something that is very natural from the point of view of the sigma models. It's sort of something that from the sigma model point of view, if you think about a Heisenberg model, is explained by sort of 
the fluctuation, so it's, it's basically what's called the Merman-Wagner theorem. If you assume the symmetry breaks, that corresponds to percolation, and you look at what the fluctuations orthogonal to the uh, broken symmetry would be, they should be free field-like. In two dimensions, free field have logarithmic um, correlations, so um, that's inconsistent with the, with the idea of broken symmetry. Um, so um, that's sort of a contradiction. So this is kind of a physics argument of why you would expect this. But the point I want to make is um, it's very natural from the spin system point of view that uh, correlations decay always, at least polynomially. Uh, on the other hand, from the point of view of, of the arboreal gas of, from the combinatorial model, I think, well, at least to me, it's very hard to understand. I'm not sure how one would, I mean, uh, I guess this is not the setting to, give, to suggest open problems, but I'd be very happy to see a, a co more probabilistic or combinatorial proof of this um, that doesn't go through these, uh, these ideas. Anyway, um, similarly, in three dimensions, what we can uh, show is that um, symmetry does break. Um, uh, the two-point function does not decay, but, and the correlations are diffusive. Again, I have no idea how to uh, uh, understand these kind of things from the point of view of, of, of the original models. Okay. Um, so the, the last, uh, I'm not going to say anything about the proof of the last argument because it, uh, this is a hard technical work and I'm not going to uh, go into this. Um, I, I want to mention one sort of conceptually uh, interesting, as I think, uh, point that has played a role in in the development of uh, how the subject got to this point, um, which is um, um, related to the fact that uh, uh, on hyperbolic spaces, there are, actually, there are very nice coordinates, which are called horospherical coordinates, and that were proposed by Martin Zinbauer in this context. Um, um, this is what it is in the case of the hyperbolic plane. Um, it's just two, two coordinates, um, and you should kind of think about them as a, a the correct analogs of uh, polar coordinates on the hyperbolic plane. Um, you can write the energy in terms of these coordinates, and the sort of important feature is that when you do this, um, there's two coordinates, which we call T and S. Um, the T coordinate is somehow nonlinear, but if you condition on it, the S coordinate is, is quadratic. So if you, it corresponds to Gaussian condition on the T. So you can integrate them out, generate some determinants and uh, reduces sort of the dimension of the model. Now, whether this is useful or not um, is not immediately apparent at this point, but, but it is, and I'll show you in a second. Um, let me just before that mention that these coordinates, they have, an, they have analogs for all of the um, higher dimensional hyperbolic superspaces, and they look very much the same. Uh, you just have more, vari more variable, like these S variables, um, possibly also fermionic ones, but they also appear in a quadratic way, so you can also integrate them out. And <clears throat> these, um, these horospherical coordinates um, um, are sort of what got uh, the interest in these models, at least for me, uh, sort of it was the entrance point to get interest in these models. Uh, the reinforced walks, they have a much, they have an independent history, which go back to uh, Diaconis, um, who didn't look at vertex reinforced walks, but edge reinforced walks. They're pretty much um, the same. But um, what he was, what he, what he and his co authors, Coppersmith and Friedman, observed is that uh, edge reinforce is equivalent to a random walk in a random environment. And um, in fact, they were also comp able to compute this environment. And the, the formula for the environment is explicit, but it's sort of, um, um, it's intricate. Uh, so it became known as the magic formula. Um, Sabo and Therese observed sort of an analog of this for the vertex reinforced jump process. And so this is what it is, doesn't matter. But what's, what sort of got interest in the community started in these models is that this is exactly the horosphere coordinates of the H22 model. And um, so the H22 model, as I mentioned, had been studied indep of independently previously, uh, but sort of this, this is the first connection observed by Sir Bo and Therese uh, between, the, uh, between these classes of models. 
Uh, of course, we were then wondering where it's coming from, and we found a different explanation, which may be more intuitive or not. It's, um, it's a kind of duality, and there's also the principle of uh, supersymmetric localization that plays a role in, at least from our perspective, explains all of this a bit more conceptually. Um, but it also, for us, opened the way to sort of view, uh, to understand that there's a more general principle here and that, uh, for example, you can get analogs of this in, in the case of the boil gas and so on. This is thought, uh, these, uh, these representations um, are still, uh, they provide a very different point of view on these models, but, um, uh, and they're not always the right point of view, but uh, they are, for example, used in proving the two-dimensional results. Um, let me leave it at this because I'm a little bit short on time. Um, I just want to, uh, maybe in one minute, say that there's lots of things in these models that we don't understand. We have some traction, or we have some traction of what we, uh, what we do understand, but, um, for example, there's the question of correlation inequalities, plays in a very important role in all sorts of statistical physics models. Here, they're actually conjectures for a bunch of models, uh, very precise, but um, very hard to prove. Um, you can ask about um, the implications of the, um, um, of the correlations in the low temperature phase. Um, there's interesting, um, it's very interesting picture, but we don't, uh, much of it is open. Uh, and uh, I think I'm going to finish here because my time is up. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Are there any questions? Okay, yes. Uh, so this uh, finishes the talk. Uh, we're slightly over time, can therefore not take uh, questions now. Anyway, I would uh, very much like to thank Mulan Bauerschmidt for the beautiful talk, uh, the audience for watching, and uh, thereby close uh, this session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.